Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mineral Rights Podcast. I am your host, Matt Sands, and with me is my trusty sidekick, Justin Williams. Hi, Justin. Good morning, Matt. Thanks for having me as always. Thanks again. And uh, we're going to talk today about uh, the second in our series of major basins and plays in the U.S. And what we're going to talk about today is the Greater Permian Basin. Um, and what we'll talk about is the Permian is a is really a huge uh, super basin. So this is going to be um, a, an overview today, and then we'll dive in in a future episode into the specific sub basins and platforms that are of major interest right now, just to get into the the detail there. But for today, provide a nice overview of where it is, the producers, the geology, the major producing reservoirs, and some of the history. And uh, you can subscribe, as always, to our show wherever you get your podcasts. And show notes can be found at mineralrightspodcast.com. And if you have any questions you'd like to have featured on the show or if you have any feedback for us, please send it to feedback at mineralrightspodcast.com. So we'll start out with the Greater Permian Basin. And what we're talking about here is probably one of the biggest and most familiar producing oil and gas uh, regions in the U.S., primarily in southeast New Mexico and in the western part of Texas or West Texas. And what it is is a sedimentary basin. And what that means is that over time with plate tectonics, it created several low spots that were then filled in by sedimentary deposition. And just to give you a feel from some of the cities and, and kind of where this is located, it front reaches from down south of Lubbock, Texas, past Midland and Odessa, and south down nearly to the Rio Grande River in uh, west central Texas. And so from there, going up westward into the southeastern part of New Mexico. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the different sub um, basins as well to give you a feel for where they're located and what they produce. But first of all, Justin, do you know where the name comes from? Yeah, it's from some of the thickest and most prolific rock uh, from the Permian geologic period. And that's where the name comes from because it's where the oil is produced from. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the Permian geologic period and the Permian basin. So just because it is, like Justin said, some of the, the most prolific Permian rock in the in the world. So it's unique in that respect. It was created when there was um, rapid deposition during the collision of North America and Gondwana. So this is that kind of after uh, Pangaea and you think about plate tectonics and all the geology and what happened, but that's where South America and Africa and, and North America collided um, between the late Mississippian through the Permian geologic periods. And like I mentioned, there's several sub-basins and sub-areas. And starting from west to east, you have the Delaware Basin, which is the second largest uh, sub-basin. You have the Central Basin Platform. And then you have the Midland Basin, which is the largest sub-basin. And then to the north in southeast New Mexico, you have the aptly named Northwest Platform. The Permian Basin is huge. So we're talking 250 miles wide by around 300 miles long, um, or 75,000 square miles. And so, you know, there is a rich history of oil and gas um, production in this area. Midland and Odessa are oil field towns. They serve as hubs for oil and gas companies and service providers in the region. And uh, the production is a mix of oil and gas. Some of the oil and, and what you'll see there is there is some sour crude. And what that means is there is H2S present, which we won't really talk about here, but just to know that it's got sweet and sour, just depending on where you're at. And some fun facts about the, the Permian Basin. Like I mentioned, it's got a rich history with over 80 years of production and over 30 billion barrels of oil produced to date. And around a quarter of the U.S. oil reserves are found in the Permian. So 
it is a, a significant and important basin when we talk about producing oil and gas um, plays. And it is front and center with the um, recent shale and unconventional explosion in the U.S. And so it is also, you know, both the, the rich um, history of conventional oil and gas production, as well as now primary focus for a lot of oil and gas companies, which Justin will talk about here in a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Odessa is also the home of uh, several museums from oil and gas. It's actually my hometown and where I grew up. Um, and growing up in the oil fields, um, it's just hundreds of years of history. And, and Odessa is technically, I mean, it's its an oil field town. That's what it's known to be. It's with the booms and the busts of the oil fields. That's right. Yeah. So that's got, you know, the our first production that was established was in Mitchell County in the Permian. And this was in 1921 uh, that well was drilled and completed in 1923. And the well was the Santa Rita number one. And it produced for nearly 70 years before it was plugged in 1990. So when we talk about oil and gas wells having um, a long life, that is an exam prime example of that. You know, now with these conventional, unconventional oil and gas wells, uh, we have we don't have that much history yet. But they also um, are expected. I think right now we're looking at wells that are producing almost 20 years into this um, kind of shale revolution. And uh, we're still learning every day about more about the decline rates and so forth. Um, but definitely a rich history, long-lived wells. And so that's a little bit about the towns and the fun facts around the Permian. What I'm going to talk about next is the geology. So if you were like me in, in Geology 101 in college and um, partially slept through the class, I understand now that I'm in, have been in the oil and gas industry for almost 20 years, I've taken a, uh, another interest in, in geology as it is important to know, to understand where oil and gas might be found. So when we talk about geology here, we're going to break it up to the individual basins and platforms that I just mentioned. And there are other smaller geologic areas, but we'll talk about kind of the four um, primary. And what we'll do is talk about the time periods and some of the major layers you're interested in. If you look at a stratigraphic column and sort of top to bottom, you know, where, how this stuff is uh, situated. So first of all, generally speaking, Permian Basin contains sedimentary rock from the Pennsylvanian, the Wolf Campion, the Leonardan, and the Guadalupian times. And an interesting fact is that the Wolf Camp formation is actually present throughout the greater Permian Basin. So that was um, something you'll hear about a lot of times with the Permian is the wolf camp now that we're talking about these uh, shale plays. So first of all, the, the Delaware Basin is the, you we're talking about the west side of the greater Permian, which is bounded by the northwest shelf to the north, central basin platform to the east, and the Wachita Marathon Thrust Belt to the south. And so if you look at this on a map, and we'll have some links in the show notes where you can pull some of this stuff up to, to learn more kind of right there, Southeast New Mexico down into uh, West Texas. And with the Midland basin, the next one is, is on the other side of that central basin platform. And this is interesting because it dips to the West. So what that means is if you look at it on a cross section, you can see the layers of rock tilted to the west and deeper to the west and shallower to the east. And it's made up of siltstone and sandstones. And it was filled through a large delta that deposited clastic sediment into the basin. And now, if you're like me and didn't know off the top of your head what clastic sediment was, it is sediment that's composed of broke, broken fragments of rock that are made up of pre-existing rocks of various sizes that were physically weathered and broken off and transported from one area and then to another where they're redeposited into another rock. So some specific examples, and these are terms you probably heard of, uh, conglomerate, sandstone, siltstone, and shales. So those are, are different types of clastic sediments. Now in the middle, I'd mentioned the central basin platform, and that is the area that separates the Delaware and Midland basins. And that's actually a carbonate rock that was established in the area and then tectonically uplifted via compression 
from the Southwest in the late Mississippian through the Pennsylvanian times, and that's around 310 to around 265 million years ago. And with carbonate, we're talking reef deposits and shallow marine clastic deposits. So instead of some of the sedimentary rock, we're talking about marine fossils, basically. And then finally, the northwest shelf. And this is that part in southeast New Mexico that has, it's a shelf edge, as it, as it sounds. And it's also reefs and then shelf carbonates. And they're in subdivided into different formations there, which we'll get into here in a second. So just as, a, as an overview, those are the kind of the four main components of the Permian Basin. And it's the largest producing basin in the U.S., so it's one of the most important. And 80% of those productive formations are located less than 10,000 feet deep. And the reason that's important, it means that they are accessible with current technology and more importantly, they can be accessed in an economic fashion. So that's why there's so much activity right now in the Permian. Before, I, I will say, if we talked about the rich history, and it really started out with the conventional oil and gas production from vertical wells. And the lithology of those primary reservoirs, it was primary limestone, dolomites, and sandstones, because those have high porosity. So this was before the advent of hydraulic fracturing, in, in kind of applied to horizontal drilling. And so this is where they've gone in. They would complete the well, and there was there's enough, if they tapped into the right spot in the reservoir, enough porosity that the oil could flow and they would be able to produce it. And then, you know, that you see the pump jacks and so forth. So for oil wells, they would put it on, have a pump jack there, produce the well oil. And this was getting into that um, time period where you'd have that steady production for a number of years. The thing that we talked about with the DJ Basin, our last basin in play overview, is the advancements in technology and the combination of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing has since expanded into the unconventional reservoirs in tight sands and shales like the Wolf Camp in the case of the Permian. And this has allowed operators to come in and now economically produce these other unconventional reservoirs that in the past were, were not economic. And we'll throw you some, some data here at you from IHS Market. Um, and there was a recent study that was done that determined that the Permian holds around 60 to 70 billion barrels of yet-to-be-produced crude oil. And again, we're talking a lot of this is in these unconventional reservoirs. And the reason this is interesting is, and just put it in perspective here, this, the recoverable reserves alone would be enough to supply every refinery in the U.S. for 12 years at current prices and would have a market value. They, they said around $3.3 trillion, which I think is a bit conservative. You know, assuming the price of oil stays around $60 a barrel, six, uh, $60 a barrel times six, $60 billion barrels is $3.6 trillion. So really massive reserves. Super Basin is what they're, they're, they call it with IHS in terms of the history and the future potential. And the reason this is in, it's in so important is there's a, a variety of stacked targets that are profitable today. And so we'll talk some about some of those specific formations that are being targeted. And if you compare this to the Middle East, this is, if it holds true, and we're talking 70 billion barrels, that's on par with the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, which is the world's biggest oil field by reserves and production. And when uh, we looked at this, you know, and some of the statistics we found were from 2013, we had about 5 million barrels a day of production and also about 70 billion barrels of remaining oil reserves and then 90 TCF of natural gas reserves remaining. So on par with, we're talking the Middle East size oil and gas reserves. And uh, so really important part of the U.S. in terms of future production as well. So we'll get into some of the specific formations here. And then we'll get into the really interesting facts. So, so bear with us with the, the geology. Thank you for sitting through Geology 101. Now we'll get to the, the meaty stuff here with respect to where we're producing oil and gas and what's being targeted and, and what counties are um, really important for these various formations. So if you have minerals in any of these counties, you'll kind of get a feel for 
what operators might be targeting in your area. So the Delaware Basin, the Bone Spring Formation, is the most drilled and most prolific zone in, in that basin. Um, we have several other important formations to talk about, the Yiso Trend, the Wolf Camp Shale, and the Avalon Shale. And important areas for the Bone Spring specifically are Eddy in Lay County, New Mexico, and then Culberson and Ward Counties in Texas. And then other counties to note that do also have Bone Spring activity, um, Chavez County, New Mexico, and then Loving, Reeves, and Jeff Davis Counties in Texas. So... Delaware Basin, again, those are the counties we're talking about. And remember, Bone Spring is the formation. Now, if you look at the stratigraphic column, you look at the different formations from, from top to bottom. You have in that Guadalupian period, some examples there, Lamar, Bell Canyon, Cherry Canyon, Brushy Canyon formations. And then getting down a little bit deeper, the Avalon Shale, and then below that, the Bone Spring, and that's in the Leonardin period. And then below that in the Wolf Campion, we have the Wolf Camp. And so if you hear, you know, we're targeting Avalon or we're targeting Bone Spring, that's above the Wolf Camp. And Or if you're lease, if you have depth um, restrictions, if they are looking to lease your minerals and you can restrict it to a specific depth, this is where it becomes interesting because you could restrict it to, you know, the bottom, a certain depth below the Bone Spring formation, for example, and then leave the Wolf Camp open and then you could have another lease that could actually lease the wolf camp. And so you have really some interesting abilities uh, if you're a savvy mineral owner to look at, you know, how you should structure the lease. And so that's, this is where this becomes important to know this information um, just as an example. And um, Justin, in your leasing and in, in your family's minerals in the, uh, in the Permian, have you guys run into any sort of depth restrictions or have you looked at, looked at that at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's something that I think it's kind of a best, best practice for mineral right owners to to do that depth limitation. And it's something we always try to do. Most operators are agreeable with that. And like you said, it keeps um, it keeps them from being able to tie up the lease to tie up the land for many years. If better technology comes, if they can drill deeper or another opportunity comes for another operator or the same operator to drill deeper. Yeah, that's a great point, because we're talking about, you know, right now, the Avalon, the Bone Spring and the Wolf Camp. Well, it could be there's some Pennsylvanian stuff down deeper that comes in and becomes a, the next big play. And so if you have those depth uh, restrictions in place, you have a lot more flexibility to uh, to get even better terms and another lease bonus for for other formations. So it opens up the, the possibility for others to come in and drill, which is a good thing if you're a mineral owner. Um, so next we're going to talk about the Midland Basin, and uh, it's also a stacked play. Long history, like we talked about. Primary focus here is the Sprawberry and Wolf Camp. And sometimes this commingled zone is called the Wolfberry Play. So that's where they're targeting both of those formations. And the highest producing oil field since 1993 is the um, Sprawberry Trend. And that's according to the Texas Railroad Commission. And that is with just under 600 million um, barrels of cumulative production. And some other formations of note here in the Midland Basin, uh, Clear Fork, Dean, Strawn, and Barnett. And when we talk about location, the primary counties here are Terry, Lynn, Gaines, D Dawson, Borden, Martin, Howard, Midland County, Glasscock, Upton, and Reagan. So big area, as you can see with the, the number of counties it covers. And in here, we talk in the Midland Basin, we'll talk a little bit about some of these conventional reservoirs that were targeted in the past, and specifically looking at like the Grayberg and the San Andreas, which um, in the Guadalupian, on the kind of shallow um, side of things. And these are important conventional oil and gas plays that um, have been producing for a long time from uh, old vertical wells, and now are, are the subject of a lot of uh, secondary and tertiary recovery. So when we talk about that, we're talking where an operator will come in and do a water flood or a CO2 flood to extract the rest of the oil that was left in the ground after primary production was done. And so they can keep con continuing to extract more oil and gas um, with advances in those um, in production technology. And then we talk about some of the unconventional 
formations. We look at the below those, you have the Sprawberry, and then below that the Wolf Camp, and then again the Pennsylvanian below all of that. So Midland Basin, important basin as well as part of the Greater Permian. And then splitting those two basins that we just talked about is the Central Basin Platform. And this is actually, you know, historically been the biggest producer from a specific formation and specifically the San Andreas. And this is where we're talking again, secondary and tertiary recoveries is going on there. And in the counties that we're looking at are um, parts of Lake County in New Mexico, and then Gaines, Andrews, Winkler, Ector, Ward, and Crane counties in Texas. And when we talk about stratigraphy, it's pretty similar to the Midland Basin in that we have in the Guadalupian, you have the Yates, the Grayberg, and the San Andreas. Then under that, a Leonardian, which we have here, the paddock, and at the top down to the Abo at the bottom. There are several formations in between. And then the Wolf Camp, of course, is present here as well. And then the Pennsylvanian stuff below that. And until um, up until about 2000, just to give you a feel for that, like I mentioned, the biggest production um, play in, in um, West Texas was that um, San Andreas. And that was the Northwest Shelf San Andreas Platform Carbonate, specifically that reservoir, and that um, formation yielded over 3.96 billion barrels of oil. Um, so that's the kind of largest oil play specifically in the greater Permian. Expect that to be eclipsed once uh, these unconventional plays are fully developed. But, you know, historically, at least up until the shale revolution, talking up to until 2000, that was the, the biggest. So, you have some stuff, in, uh, and you know more about a little bit about the Central Basin Platform, Justin. What what do you know about this area? Uh, something that's kind of changed over the last few years, especially in like Andrews and Ector County, is saltwater disposable has become a um, huge revenue generator for mineral right owners uh, because the oil companies are needing somewhere to to put the the flooding, like you're saying, in the second recovery operations and the fluids used from that. Um, it's become something that you just you see all the time now. Yeah, there is a lot of produced water. And we'll talk a little bit about the infrastructure and, and some of that other stuff here when Justin covers that. But just to know, definitely an important area, Central Basin Platform. And when we talk about the next one, finally, is this Northwest Shelf. And with the Northwest Shelf, the interesting part about it is, according to a study by University of Texas, up until around 2000, the Northwest Shelf San Andreas Platform Carbonate had yielded over 3.96 billion barrels of oil, which makes it the largest single oil play in the greater Permian Basin, at least up until that time. Um, I expect that a lot of these shale plays will eclipse that uh, when things are said and done. But historically, up until 2000 at least, it was the, the biggest um, play. Now, the Northwest Shelf has the Capitan Reef, and this is a reef deposit along the edge of the Delaware Basin, um, also known as Capitan Limestone. And kind of going back to some of the geology there, the Permian Sea was there, and then it retreated and deposited evaporites. And you're thinking evaporites, think of salts and gypsum and stuff like that. And with the Northwest Shelf, we have, again, similar stratigraphy to the Central Basin Platform and that you have the Guadalupian, you have Yates, uh, the Grayberg are there. Um, in the Leonardin, we're talking about things like um, Victorio Peak, Dolomite, and then a Bone Spring. Limestone is there as well. So a little bit different in terms of that reef deposit, which kind of kind of borders the the Delaware Basin and, and to the south part of the Northwest Shelf, which is kind of an interesting uh, fun fact about you know how it was formed. Now I'm going to talk about a couple more things relative to the geology, and then I'll hand it over to Justin to talk about some of the, the what, what you can expect from your minerals in the future around infrastructure and kind of constraints and what the activity level is and some of the major operators. But before then, interesting fact is that with the geologic risk you have here, um, I guess on the plus side, you have relatively low geologic risk given the extensive knowledge about the area. The basin has been studied for almost 100 years and the unique geology that is present there makes it easier for operators to drill current well prices 
and some of the best performing wells in the Permian can even break even at just under $22 a barrel, um, according to a report we found by Global Data. So the thing to know that there is that there's really good economics, like I mentioned, because of the, the depth of some of these formations and how just with everything going on, they can produce it um, and, the, and the reserves are there, uh, good reserves. With the unconventional resources, as they're tapped, we're learning more about the decline rates. Now, I'd say probably the, one of the bigger risks associated with their, this area is just our lack of history with unconventional reserves. And this is kind of can be said probably about any basin or play that is really focused on these unconventional oil and gas um, formations. Because as we are producing these wells into later into their life, we're learning more about the decline rates. And a recent study by Wood McKenzie shows that the decline rates for the first um, generation of tight oil wells in the Permian are increasing at a greater rate than we expected going in. So this means that the month-to-month -month production rate is going down faster than they originally anticipated because when they built their type curves, in, when a type curve is, is sort of that production pro profile over time and what's expected from these wells, they use a lot of the data from these conventional plays. And so they model it as closely as they can, given what they know at the time. But sometimes it could be off a little bit. And that's what we're finding here in the Permian. And the, the near-term impact is pretty minimal. But what it does mean is if these wells continue to decline at these um, increasing rates, is that operators will need to drill more wells in the future to maintain the levels of growth that they have planned and that they talk about today when we hear about some of the, the facts and figures about how much they're going to spend and, and stuff like that. So they may end up needing to spend more to reach those production targets that they've set for themselves. So that's a little bit about kind of the underground. Now let's talk about above ground, Justin. What do you got? Absolutely. Well, and infrastructure is always a huge part of the oil fields. And thankfully, in, in West Texas, it's a more developed infrastructure, but it has its issues. Um, right now, frac sand is a huge problem in the United, or in the Permian Basin. Um, it accounts for 37% of the total frac sand demand in the United States in 2017. And that's according to IHS market. Um, and some operators are now actually working directly with mineral right owners, not only for sand, but actually for um, secondary water recovery systems, um, using their ponds, using their water. I mean, different things like that because they're finding it to be uh, less cost. Um, some of the economic rims in the Permian Basin, increasing costs are expected at the current rate of spending, and that's something that, that's playing a huge toll in the Permian Basin. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but it's going to cause issues with smaller companies because there there's just too much risk for them to go into the these areas where the larger operators are that have a, a larger pocket. Um, something that's also becoming a big problem with some of the operators is they don't have continuous acreage. As they're trading deals and getting different land from different people, they're finding that they're having issues uh, drilling these long horizontal wells and having the rights to be able to do that. One of the interesting things that has kind of come out recently is Global Data Energy came out with an interesting report in May of 2018. They analyzed uh, wells drilled by 26 different operators in the area. They found that the break-even oil prices for wells with lateral links of 4,500 to 10,500 feet range from 21 to $48 a barrel. And this is a big advantage in the Permian Basin uh, because it allows them to, to produce the oil and know that they can do so even at a lower uh, price. One of the big issues that has been going on, um, and especially in Odessa and Midland area, uh, for quite a while now, is uh, with some of the super majors coming in pretty late to the game, it's created an unbelievable supply and demand problem with the Odessa workforce. Um, and this is something that the Odessa workforce knows all too well over the years. But a great example of this is uh, truck drivers right now that support the oil fields. They're bringing in salaries of about $120,000 a year range. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that's crazy compared to other parts of the United States. So this is creating a huge cost for the operators and making it more expensive for them to be able to produce. Um, and it's also going to affect how many wells they're going to produce because that will bring more costs on as well. Um, one of the things that's always kind of a constraint in the Permian Basin and always has been is uh, gas pipelines. And one of the things that's kind of happening now with the operators is that, you know, with not being able to release the gas into the environment, not being able to really get that gas to market as quickly and as effectively as they should, um, they're dropping the pricing of the gas to be in order to be able to move that. And it's becoming um, something that the people are really getting worried about. And there's a real danger of hub pricing being at a loss unless new pipelines are built to take that product to market. 
Um, one feature of shell is that at a certain point in a well's lifespan, this is something that's huge in the Permian Basin, cast production increases rapidly to the exclusion of oil production. Um, and this is something that's known as the bubble point, uh, but it can create huge problems if they can't get that gas to market. Um, Pioneer stock plunged 16% a single day in August after revealing a higher than expected gas content in some of their wells. Um, this is something that is going to be something to really watch in the Permian Basin and be sure that they can get that supply and demand problem fixed. Um, something else that this is new to me that I haven't heard about, which makes a lot of sense, though, um, the drilling intensity with new wells being drilled at a ferocious rate over all over the basin. There's a risk that the fractures created in the rock may start to interfere with one another, reducing pressure and ultimately the returns from those wells. Um, it's especially true with the lateral wells reaching farther than ever into the Permian, uh, Permian's horizontal layers. I mean, they're afraid that the interference and the spacing of these wells could cause problems with being able to um, stay on the same production, kind of as Matt touched on there. Um, one of the downsides to the tighter well spacing is the well and well interference could bring Permian production forward by four years, putting more than 1.5 million barrels per day of future production in question. On the flip side, improvements in technology may also offset this, and we can only hope that the technology will get better as we kind of go. Um, one of the things that uh, mineral right owners are happy about and something that I've been happy about in the Permian Basin, uh, but I guess operators not so much, is the land cost. Um, the attractiveness of the Permian's reserves and the multiple layers like Matt spoke about, it's pushed the cost of land uh, to twice the cost of other places in the United States. Um, it's made it more difficult for new people to get into the game. Um, and it's also made technological processing and getting along further in the game by bringing in new people to try new technologies and do new things, um, it's become less effective. And that's something that's kind of a concern. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, one of the big problems that they're kind of experienced now is with um, different people swapping land and sharing rights. Um, there's become a big issue with having the continuous rights to the land so they can drill the long horizontal wells, which helps them to be profitable. Um, something else that is a concern that's been talked about a little bit, but we'll see where this kind of goes over the next year, is even though the soaring production has really been going, some of the returns that the different operators have showed just really haven't been that strong. In the last year, the S&P 500 Energy Index dropped 1.7% admitted an 18% gain in West Texas Intermediate Crude. Um, the overall S&P 500 has gained 17% this year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if the companies can kind of offset the cost and become more effective in producing that oil so they can benefit from the uh, profits of that. A key feature of the shell is one of the things that it does is it comes online very quickly um, in a space of time, months as opposed to years that it takes to get, some, to get a major offshore well flowing. Um, this means quicker cash returns for the producers. But like Matt mentioned, one of the concerns is they're afraid that they're going to have to really drill more wells. So one of the focuses that's kind of creeping up is driving the cost down on being able to drill those new wells and being able to do them quickly. Um, some of the major operators um, and also once the top 10 acreage holders, which I kind of find this surprising, Oxy, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Apache, ConocoPhillips, um, Devon, Pioneer, Conoco, EOG, and Cimarax are the top um, acreage holders in the Permian Basin. Yeah, so that's interesting, Justin. So you mentioned some of the major operators, and you know, I used to work for Shell for a number of years, and I know they were um, very active uh, along with Anadarko, and I'm surprised to hear that they weren't on the top 10 acreage holder list. Um, so it just goes to show you how much activity there is out there and then, you know, how, how just how huge the, the Permian is. Absolutely. And it looks like it's, you know, for years to come, we're going to be seeing oil production. Um, the, you know, the hope is that technology will really improve and they'll become more effective at producing. So those costs just don't get the best of it. Um, one of the things that's kind of funny, I, I was looking the other day at the hotels in Odessa. And right now, hotels are ranging anywhere from 800 to 1200 a night due to the demand of bringing workers into that area. Wow. And that's, I assume, for like a Holiday Inn Express type of a hotel or something like that? You, you've you got it. And, you know, wow. Odessa's experienced this before, and they can only build so fast. But, um, you know, if oil takes a downturn, Odessa will be a, be a ghost city for a while. Yeah, boom and bust cycle. Hopefully that doesn't, doesn't bust. Um, you know, hopefully it keeps booming for a number of years, um, which it sounds like it has definitely the potential to do so with all the uh, stacked plays. Definitely bright future, I think. When you mentioned a little bit about some of the cost things, one of the things that was pretty interesting when I was doing some of the research here, you mentioned the frac sand, and you know some of these companies are now opening up sand mines and getting into the sand mining business. And 
trying to get more vertically integrated and reduce some of their supply costs. To your point, instead of having to buy it from a service company who's going to mark it up based on the demand, if they can control those costs at a fixed rate, that is uh, is going to be helpful to, to those companies to keep the economics um, positive. Um, and the other thing that was interesting is these have this white, sand sourced from the Midwest, a lot of sand mines there. And it was, you know, then they have to truck it or send it by rail to Texas. And now what they're doing is actually opening these uh, sand mines in Texas through the proximity to the, to the Permian. So they're being built and expanded to help with the demand for, uh, for frac sand, which is really important in the completion operation uh, for those new unconventional wells. So but hopefully, like you said, the, the future is looking bright. You want to talk a little bit about that, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, kind of to your effect with the sand and different things like that, that's also creating new opportunities for um, surface owners, middle right owners, um, which is great. It puts some money into people's pockets and kind of gets the economy moving. Um, and in the West Texas, you know, I don't think we'll see anything but more opportunities to come and more operators. One of the things that's been interesting over the last year is um, so many of the top operators are working together. Um, and you mentioned Shell and Anarco. Um, in the West Texas, they have a great agreement where Shell and Anarco are working together. And, and a huge part of Reeves County, Loving County, and different areas, um, and it's just made a great relationship for them to be able to be profitable and be able to get things done quickly. Yeah, that is that is helpful. Yeah, I think you see those synergies form when, you know, out of uh, necessity and, and uh, you know, those efficiencies that those companies can take advantage of. They're always looking to to try to reduce cost and be more efficient and effective. So that's, that's awesome. Absolutely. And I think that was, you know, a pretty great recap on the West Texas area and it'll be interesting to see what comes over the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. And I know there's some statistics coming up here in 2023. So over the next five years, they're talking uh, about the Permian um, production reaching a total of around 5.4 million barrels a day, which is, you know, close to that, number that I mentioned for the for Saudi Arabia. So we're talking, you know, similar production, similar reserves. And the way that they're going to do that is through drilling 41,000 new wells and $308 billion in upstream spending over the next five years between all of those major operators in the greater Permian Basin. So ton of activity, only good things for mineral owners in terms of demand for um, leasing and for purchasing. So if you are looking to lease, there's that competition that's already heating up or has heated up over this past several years. And so, um, you know, definitely um, you can you can leverage that to get a really favorable terms, I think, in, in today's environment. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's our, our recap of the Greater Permian Basin. We hope that you found this useful, especially if you are a mineral owner in West Texas or in southeastern New Mexico. If you have any questions that you'd like us to feature uh, in another episode um, or any other basin you'd like us to have a cover relative to where you own minerals, just let us know. We're happy to do so. And as always... Find us at mineralrightspodcast.com. And if you'd like to help out the show, we ask that you please leave an honest rating and review on iTunes. That's really the, the best way to, um, to show any appreciation. That will help us reach um, more mineral owners like yourselves and so that we can get this information to them as well. Thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.